What's going on? I'm John, and today I'm going to be sharing the most intriguing and impactful lessons that I learned from reading Plot and Structure by James Scott Bell. This book is full of lessons that would benefit both story structure newbies and experts. So I went through, took some notes, and extracted the 10 most impactful lessons for me in this book, and I'm sharing them with you right now. Oh, and I'll be sharing the most valuable lesson last. So stick around for that one. The first lesson is pretty simple, but it's something that's good to keep in mind when you're creating a story. And this is the concept that he calls unanticipating. Basically, people have had so much exposure to stories through movies and books and all sorts of other media. And because of that, people have an inherent guess of what is going to happen in any one scene. And you obviously don't want to give them exactly what they think is going to happen because that's going to lead to a boring story. To combat this, Bell suggests that when you're figuring out ideas for a scene, throw out your first idea. And after you've done that, then start brainstorming for ideas that would be surprising to readers and that would really catch them off guard. Number nine, the plotting systems medley. This is actually a collection of lessons that came from one of my favorite parts of reading this book. The first is something that I think is vital for writers, and this is the concept of writing your back cover copy before you write the book. And the reason why I think this is so valuable is because first, it forces you to come up with a very concrete idea of what this book is going to be about. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, by getting a very clear focus for the book, it's easier to market the book later down the road, whether it's you marketing it or a publisher marketing it. And that means that it's easier for people to find your book and to read it. And also there is a worksheet for creating this back cover copy in the end at the appendix. I thought the worksheet looked pretty good and I would like to use it when I'm getting ready to write the next book. Now the second part of the plotting systems medley is something that I I had heard about before, but I always had this vague idea about and never really saw a clear example of. And this is the concept of writing a treatment for a story. And basically what a treatment is, is a present tense overview of the story. It's usually pretty long, 20 to 40 pages, and you're just going over what's going to happen in the story in its entirety. And because you're taking all this space to do it, you're getting a very detailed idea about what's going to happen in the story, but still leaving a lot of what the story is going to be out of it. And thus making it faster to write than just writing a first draft in more of a pantsing style. Nothing against Panzig, of course, but this is about plotting systems, so <laughs> you can imagine who it's for. And part of the process for creating the treatment is actually editing it until you think the story is solid. And this is a concept that I really am looking forward to trying out myself because I think this could be super valuable. We'll have to see what happens with that in a future video. And now the third and final piece of this plotting systems medley is something that he calls the David Morel method. And what this is, is basically journaling about your story idea, continually asking yourself questions about it to follow all those rabbit holes and find out the true potential for your story. And I actually did this one time inadvertently before I even heard of this. I was on a run and I was just thinking about the story and trying to figure out different ideas for it and just continually asking questions. And this helped me create one of my favorite character arcs in the second book of my epic fantasy series. So it was really useful and I can definitely vouch for this method. Okay, number eight, coming up with the right ideas. First, I'll let Bell communicate why choosing the right idea is so important. Not every idea is worth writing about. Why spend six months, a year, 10 years hammering out something that editors, agents, and not to mention readers will not care about. And this is so true because even if you're a very fast writer who can take a book from the idea phase to the proofreading phase in just one month, that's still a whole month of your life. And to be honest, most of us are not able to write books that quickly yet. So it takes us even more time and more commitment to an actual idea. So you want to make sure you choose the right one. The technique Bell describes basically goes like this. First, you wanna have weekly idea time set aside. You want it to be around 30 minutes where you don't have any distractions. You want to get yourself into a relaxed state and just start letting the ideas flow, letting your imagination go wild, not having any censorship, not having any judgment, and letting the ideas come, trying to be playful and even silly with it and just enjoying the process as much as possible. And after you've finished with your idea time, that is when you look over the ideas that you had and you analyze them and pick out the ones that you think are the best. And then you decide which ones you want to develop further. And this technique definitely has a cumulative effect because if you were only able to come up with say 20 ideas 
per week in that 30 minute block, then by the end of a year, you would have 1,040 ideas. And a lot of them might not be very good, but there would definitely be ideas in there that you were super excited to write about. Number seven, I'm calling this mindset fundamentals. Although I was already familiar with all of these concepts, I thought that they were so important that I had to include them anyway. These are the foundations to becoming great at any skill. And of course, that includes writing. One of the main things Bell talks about is the concept of a growth mindset. And basically, this is the belief that you can gain new skills, that you can grow and change and improve, and that your level of ability is not fixed at birth. And you can imagine how necessary this is if you actually want to improve your skills as a writer. You have to believe it's possible first. Second, he talks about a concept called self signaling. This is basically using various things to remind yourself of your goals and your identity. So he recommends writing down your goals and putting them somewhere easy to see, as well as surrounding yourself with things that remind you of your identity as a writer. For instance, he has a poster that reminds him and a cup, a mug that reminds him all of his identity as a writer. And this last one is vital. It's about applying the knowledge that you actually learn rather than just engaging in empty sort of education without actual application. And the reason why this is so important is because say that you're just learning something, you're reading various books about writing and you're not actually applying them, not actually applying any of the lessons in them, likely you're not going to remember any of that stuff and that's going to make it so much harder to make progress and actually benefit from the things you're learning. Lesson number six, this is Bell's take on revision. And I like Bell's take on revision because it's very comprehensive and gives you a step-by-step -step approach to actually revising a story. So I'm thinking about using this next time I'm doing revision because I currently don't really have that defined of a process. My process is pretty vague and just being able to plug into something that's step-by-step -step would be easy and then I can adjust as I go. So these are the basic steps that he talks about. First, he advises you to let the story sit so you can get some space from it, but he doesn't advise a ton of time to let the story sit. He says two, three weeks is enough. Second, he asks you to get prepared for revision because the revision process can be pretty lengthy and it can be hard, especially if you're not the type of person who really likes the revision process. So this part of the process is all about getting yourself excited about how you're going to be improving your story so much with each step of the process and knowing that by doing this you're going to get something amazing at the end. The third step is reading through the actual story and he says to focus on the big picture elements at first just pay attention to big things like story, characters, and potential alternative directions for the plot. Pay attention if the stakes are being raised, if your story is fitting a three-act structure, all these sorts of high level things at this phase. Then he advises to ask yourself questions about the different aspects of the story. For example, here are some of the questions he suggests you ask about the lead character. Is the character memorable, compelling, enough to carry the reader all the way through the plot? Does this character avoid cliches? Is he capable of surprising us? What's unique about the character? After you've done all this stuff, he advises you to brood over all that you've thought about and to journal about the observations you had at the start of each day. And after doing this brooding for a few days, we move on to the next step, which is writing the second draft. And he mentions that here, you want to do whatever you can to implement the changes you just came up with in the previous step, whether that's starting from scratch or just copy and pasting a lot and inserting scenes and taking things out, whatever you've got to do to implement these changes. Now, the second to last step is the refining stage. For the refining phase, you want to set the draft aside for another week and then read through it one more time. Then you can start working on tightening and cutting scenes, deepening characters, and expanding and revising subplots. And this step is really about making all of those big picture elements of the story as good as you can. You want the elements of character, plot, and theme to be nailed down by the end of the step. And the last step is what he calls the polishing step. And this is about really just putting the final touches into this story. And he talks about two major passes, one with regard to dialogue and making the dialogue as good as it can be, and a second with regard to scenes and really getting those scenes to the point where every single one is interesting and leads to the next one. And Bell highlights one of the most important aspects of rewriting when he says, learn to love rewriting because it's a necessary part of the craft. You are going to be a better writer every time you go through the process and your plots will be stronger by far. And now we're ready to move on to lesson number five. And this is something I think most people don't do, but that they would greatly benefit from doing. And this is analyzing the idea before you start writing. And the main ways Bell talks about analyzing an idea are first, to make sure that you actually care about this idea enough to spend a long time with it. And I really like the part where Bell talked about how important it is to make novels personal. Why are so many novels rejected? One reason is that they seem cookie cutter. They follow the crowd because the writer often thinks, gee, if I write something like something else that is successful, I can get published. This is a major mistake. Without a passionate commitment to the plot as a story you're burning to tell, 
your voice will not be original or compelling. The second part of the analysis process is making sure that the market, aka readers, care enough to actually read it. You want to look at the story at this point from the perspective of a publishing company or an investor. Is this something that you think would be worth investing time and money into? And I really love this because I think a lot of people who are trying to publish traditionally don't even really consider this. They think the publisher will handle all the marketing for them, but the problem is if the book is not written in a way that the market actually wants it, then it will be hard for the publisher to market in general. And even if they do pick it up, it'll be harder for them to sell. And the third step is making sure to narrow down the idea to something that is easy to understand. So for instance, with the series that I'm writing, it's not just normal fantasy, it is also epic fantasy. And you can even go into more niche markets here as well. A good place to find out some of these is by looking into the Amazon bestsellers. They have all sorts of different subgenres that you can see there, whether it's military fantasy or swords and sorcery fantasy, or whether it's cozy mysteries or all those sorts of things. And now one of the most important lessons in this video, number four, make sure to smash that like button if you're enjoying this video so that YouTube knows to share with other writers like you. And now for the real lesson four, and this is actually one of my favorite concepts and ideas from this entire book. This is the concept of learning more about plotting through drilling. And by drilling, Bell is basically talking about using very targeted practice to improve your understanding of plots. So here's how he says to go about it. First, you choose six books of the type that you want to write. And this can also include some novels that you've already read. You make a schedule that you can stick to to get all of these books read through and analyzed. You read the first book for pleasure. And then after you finish it, you take a day to just let the ideas spin in your mind about it to percolate on this book. You wanna think about how this book made you feel, what sorts of themes it contained, how the plot was constructed, did it ever drag, those sorts of things. Then you go back and you repeat that last step for all the remaining books. Once you're done with that, then you go back to book one and you record the critical information for every single scene. So some examples of this information might be the setting, POV character, summary, scene type, whether the scene made you want to read to the next scene or not and why. And then you repeat this last step for all of the remaining books as well. And once you've got all of these detailed outlines of the plots, you read through each of the plots in order to really solidify your understanding of how the plots work and be able to look for similarities and see how stories like the ones you wanna tell are constructed. Okay, now number three, and this is a big one. This is making scenes more interesting. In this lesson, Bell is giving us tactics to make our scenes so much better. He focuses on three main things, the hook, intensity, and a prompt. Here's how Bell explains the importance of the hook. The hook is what grabs the reader's attention from the start and gets him pulled into the narrative. And here is where many a writer stumbles, feeling there needs to be adequate description of the location first, then the characters. A writer may tend to start his scene slowly. This, of course, is a logical choice. We think in a linear fashion and we figure we have to get the readers seeing the location, then the characters in location before we can get to all the good stuff like action and dialogue. Don't fall into this trap. Readers don't care about the natural order if they're in tree. The second step is the intensity step. And this is all about making sure that after the reader has been hooked, that you keep the intensity up high enough so that readers want to continue reading through the scene. And this third step is really more about the next scene than it is about this one. And this is the prompt, making sure that you leave readers with something that's going to make them curious enough to want to read the next scene. So some good examples are a mysterious line of dialogue, a secret reveal, a major decision, an announcement of a huge event, surprise, or a question lingering in the air. You can imagine some of what I'm talking about here. Number two is, in my opinion, one of the most important lessons that you can focus on in writing in general. And if it weren't for how impactful number one was personally for me, this might have been the number one lesson. So pay attention. <laughs> and this lesson is all about connecting readers with the lead character. This is vital. Think about it. If your reader doesn't care about the lead character, then even if you have the most exciting stakes in your story, it will be meaningless because those stakes are happening to a character that they don't care about. So Bell talks about four important elements of creating this connection between the reader and character. The first is identification better known as empathy. And this is basically making sure that you give the character relatable traits that the reader can understand and see the humanity in. So for example, giving your character goals, fears, and weaknesses. These are the main things that are really going to allow readers to 
connect with the character. But the second element is going to deepen that connection, and this is sympathy. And basically, creating sympathy is kind of about being mean to the characters a little bit. You want to put them in jeopardy, whether this is physical or emotional. You want to put them through hardship. Give them challenges that are hard to overcome. You want to make them the underdog. Give them an opponent that is so much stronger than them. You want to make them vulnerable. You want to show weaknesses that could lead to trouble for them. Now, the third element is likability. And this one is not as necessary as the previous two. Those previous two are vital. But likability is a way you can boost that connection with the lead character even further. And the main things to think about here is basically like, <laughs> Is this character somebody that you would want to be friends with? Think about the traits you like in a friend, and that's kind of what you want to amplify with likability. Is this character witty? Are they kind and supportive? Do they care about others? These sorts of things. Focus on bringing out those to make the character likable. And fourth is inner conflict. This is showing the doubts that your character has, giving them those two competing voices in their head, so the reader is not so sure which one is going to win out. All of us can definitely relate to that experience where we have two competing interests, and we don't know which one to choose. And now my personal favorite lesson from this entire story was something he calls the intensity scale. And the reason I love this lesson so much is because it's really all about learning when to show and when to tell. So when introducing the intensity scale, Bell says, one of the best plot rules, of course, is show, don't tell. But this is not a law. Sometimes a writer tells as a shortcut to get to the meaty part of a scene. Showing is essentially about making scenes vivid. But if you try to do it constantly, the parts that are supposed to stand out won't and your readers will get exhausted. And I think this is something that is really hard for a lot of writers. We all hear that phrase, show, don't tell. But honestly, it's a very vague concept and it's hard to know what it means. So that is where the intensity scale comes in. Basically, in your scenes, there's going to be an intensity level that varies throughout the length of the scene. And usually it's going to build throughout the scene. The reason why this is important is because you want to visualize the moments of the story as having a rating in intensity. And this rating would go from zero to 10. 10 being the most intense moments of which you would only have a few in the entire story. And zero being super boring and dry moments, which you probably wouldn't want to have any in your story. Basically, when the intensity goes above a five on the scale is when you want to focus on showing and really bringing out the intensity of those moments. And when the intensity drops below five is when you want to focus more on telling and just using that narrative summary to get us to those more important moments where we are showing. And this lesson was really a light bulb moment for me because you always hear show don't tell you always hear about showing versus telling but you never really hear anybody talk about when to show versus when to tell and that is why i think this lesson is the most important lesson in this book and i'm curious what is your favorite piece of writing advice let us all know in the comments below so that we can all benefit from this piece of advice too and make this community a place where we help each other and if you're looking for another writing craft book with some of those light bulb moment lessons then you want to check out the video i made on the emotional craft of fiction next I don't know. See you later. <laughs>